My name is Dan Lynch. I'm a wildlife education specialist with the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And today we're going to talk about wildlife forensics. So what is it? Well, wildlife forensics are techniques that state game wardens use to try and solve crimes related to wildlife in Pennsylvania. Animals can't really speak for themselves. So when our wardens use these techniques, sometimes they have the ability to speak for them, figure out what kind of crimes are being committed, and bring the violators to justice. You know what, before we go any further, I want you to go ahead and pause and click the video and click on the link that says Wildlife Forensics Pretest. It's a short, simple test, but it gives you an idea of what you know already about wildlife forensics. Then when you come back and we learn more about wildlife forensics, you'll see just how much more involved wildlife forensics is. So go ahead, pause the video now, and I'll be waiting for you when we get back. I hope you did well on the pretest. Throughout the forensic activities, we're, we're going to cover all the test questions and more. So let's get started. So what is wildlife forensics? Simply put, it's the study of wildlife crimes or cases from a legal perspective. Forensics simply means pertaining to the law. Some examples of wildlife cases that you might be thinking about would be killing protected species or killing too many of one species or possibly killing before or after hunting hours or hunting seasons or even just possessing wildlife parts or pieces. Those are some examples of wildlife crimes or cases. The Pennsylvania Game Commission is a state agency responsible for all wild birds and mammals and that's why we deal with wildlife forensics in the state. We don't always use forensic techniques to solve cases. And I'll give you an example. If one of our wardens is out uh, checking hunters during uh, groundhog season and the groundhog hunter does not wearing a solid fluorescent orange hat, we don't really need forensic techniques to figure that out. The warden can go out and he or she can talk to the person, explain that they need to be wearing the orange hat. If they're concerned about it, they might just take their camera out and take a picture of it or their phone out. And that way they've got evidence in case it goes to court. But they didn't really need forensic techniques. But if, let's say, you're trying to decide if someone harvested a deer prior to or after the hunting hours, now that's an example of how we might be able to use forensic techniques to try to solve that. And then that's what we call time of death, or TOD. So we're gonna, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of those things that we might use to determine time of death. So let's talk about some of the tools and the items that I have here on the table that we sometimes use for forensics. We'll start with this skull. So as a uh, forensic scientist um, or a warden who's going to be using forensics, uh, we need to know a lot about different birds and mammals in Pennsylvania. And many times we're talking about parts and pieces or skulls and bones. So our officers need to know that, for example, that this is a cow elk skull. I mean, it's a huge skull. You can see that it doesn't have the pedestals on there where the antlers would be, so that immediately will tell you that it's a cow. Um, and, you know, we're going to also look at the dentition sometimes to determine age of an animal. If someone says, oh, it was a young animal, they killed a calf, uh, we can kind of look at dentition to determine whether or not they might be telling the truth or not. So our officers definitely, our wardens definitely need to know about skulls. Bones are another thing. So this particular bone is a pelvis bone of a deer. And in particular, it's a male deer. Um, it's difficult to tell sometimes when they're immature, but if you have an example of a mature male and a mature female deer, there's about five different locations on the pelvis that you can use to determine the difference between male and female. And why would you even need to? Well, certain seasons you're only allowed to harvest males or those with antlers and those um, that, that are what we call antlerless. And if someone says, oh yeah, it was a mature doe, and our officers had only the carcass to go by um, and not a head or any um, of the reproductive parts, they might be able to use the, the bone, the pelvis bone, to determine it. And one of the areas is in the pubic arch right here. On a male uh, deer, the, an adult male deer is going to have a very thick pubic arch, and on a female it's going to be very, very thin because that's the area that the fawn is going to pass through. So those are kinds of things that an officer would know. I kind of stick with the deer. Um, a lot of our cases involve deer because deer is such a popular thing for people to go hunting. So our officers can use different uh, techniques to try to determine time of death or TOD. One of those things that we're going to determine is temperature. So if we were to come upon a carcass um, of a deer, there's a couple things that we're going to take temperatures for to try to help us to determine when the animal was killed. It's not exact, 
but it'll get you close. So we're gonna need a couple different types of thermometers. The one thermometer that I have here is a digital thermometer, thermometer with a very long probe. And where this probe would go after you turned it on would be up in the nasal cavity. So we would put it up on each side of the nasal cavity and the idea is to get as close to the temperature to the brain as possible and I'll explain why in a second. So nasal temperature is one. The next temperature is gonna be thigh temperature and for that we're gonna use this meat thermometer. So the thigh is a very large muscle mass in the deer and that would normally go from the inside and we would stick it in there about an inch or inch and a half and both in the nostril and in the thigh we would probably leave it sit there for about a minute or so and record the temperatures. The next thing we're going to probably look at for time of death of deer is vertical pupil diameter. So what we're going to do is on this mount right here we would take a flashlight and we would shine the flashlight obviously the deer is dead. We would shine the flashlight in the deer's eyeball and what we would see, and I have a, a taxidermy eyeball here, is what we would see is we'd see a reflective glow from that eyeball when you shine the flashlight on it. When a deer is alive or up to within about two hours after death, when you shine a flashlight on the deer's eyeball, it will glow back round. But as time progresses, the vertical, vertical pupil diameter will get smaller and smaller and thinner and thinner till it's a slit. The horizontal uh, uh, measurement will stay the same but vertically it will get smaller. Basically what's happening is the fluids are leaving the eye, the muscles are contracting, and it is squeezing that pupil down to it's a tiny little slit. So what our wardens can do is they could take a, a millimeter ruler or a calipers, and they could literally lay it on the deer's eyeball and count the millimeters of um, the vertical pupil diameter, record that information, and that's another determining factor on time of death. The third time of death would be rigor mortis. And rigor mortis is basically what happens to a mammal anywhere from 12 to 36 hours after death. Uh, a mammal is going to get a buildup of lactic acid in the dying muscle tissues, which basically stiffens the muscles. So um, we kind of have what we call a none partial and full um, category of them. So full rigor mortis would be if this is the deer's leg, you couldn't bend it at all. That's full rigor mortis. Partial, you can slightly bend it, and none would be the deer who was so recently um, deceased that it basically just flops. So we have a none, partial, and full, and those are some of the things that we use to determine uh, time of death on deer. Some of the other items that we have here would be casts. This is a plaster Paris cast of a foot, um, uh, of actually of a sole of a shoe. And this particular one happens to be from a running shoe. Um, we will sometimes use plaster pairs to record evidence, uh, track evidence of a person, of wildlife itself, or possibly even a tire. So those are some other things that we use. Measuring tapes, we're trying to determine distance from one thing to another. Either a digital camera or a camera on an iPhone or a cell phone. Uh, one thing you can't do is take too many pictures anymore. Because it's all digital, you want to take lots and lots of pictures. Sometimes you take a picture of something at a crime scene and you don't realize till later on when you're looking at it on the computer just how much information is actually there. So it's really important to take a lot of photos. Uh, fingerprint evidence is another thing. We take fingerprint evidence sometimes off of an antler, off of a vehicle, off of a gun or a bow or a knife. We use tweezers to pick up very, very tiny little pieces of evidence, what we call trace evidence. So one thing that's kind of interesting about deer hair, and sometimes we'll find deer hair, one deer hair on the trunk of a vehicle. What's interesting about deer hair is that deer hair is hollow. So when you take it and you bend it over, it breaks like a teepee. No other mammal hair in Pennsylvania breaks like a teepee. It bends, it curls, but it does not break like a teepee. So we might be using tweezers to simply pick up one piece of hair. Uh, we might also use tweezers to pick up a bullet. So this happens to be a lead bullet. It could be copper, it could be brass. We could be looking for shotgun shell wads or shotgun shells or rifle or handgun ammunition as well. Sometimes our officers or wardens might use a lead test kit. And a lead test kit might be something that would be used to determine whether or not an animal was harvested with a gun or a bow. If it's in archery season, you're not allowed to use a gun. So if someone was to shoot one with a gun, a small caliber gun like a 22 or a 17, 
and then after they shoot it, they take a, their broadhead and shove it through the wound um, they, to try to disguise the fact that they used a gun. We might be able to use a lead test kit on the muscle to actually determine whether or not there was lead there, which if it was archery, there wouldn't be any lead. We might even be able to use evidence from feathers. So in addition to knowing bones and skulls, our wardens are really good at knowing what feather comes from what species and whether or not that species can be determined by the sex by the feathers. Um, in this particular case, this is a turkey breast feather. Um, so not only do wardens know that it's a turkey breast feather, but by looking at the very tip of it, which is black, they'll be able to tell that this is from a male. <clears throat> we also sometimes use um, insect evidence. Not always, but sometimes. In, in human uh, forensic cases, they probably use um, insects a lot more um, because there are many times the body is around a lot longer. Where in animals, many times a poacher is going to take the body and use it, the meat or whatever, so we're not going to get a whole lot of e insect evidence. But these are some examples of different insects that show up on a, uh, a carcass after death, sometimes within five minutes after death, and sometimes they only show up maybe five or six hours after death. But forensic entomology um, is the study of, of insects and how it relates to the law. A lot of this information that I just talked about, um, we're getting, we're collecting data. And what we need to know is we need to know what do we compare it to? So uh, especially if it's going to go to court. So we have this, what we call the Blue Book or the Wildlife Forensics Field Manual. And in this Blue Book, there's lots and lots of data of known tests that were done on deer, bear, waterfowl, all the different species, so that we can compare the things that we find in our cases to known standards. So we use that kind of stuff a lot. I think the last tool that I have here um, would be the metal detector. Um, kind of makes sense. We're, we may use a metal detector when we're looking for shell casings or bullet fragments in a carcass, in the ground, uh, maybe it's a littering case, something like that. Um, so we use metal detectors a lot. These are just some of the tools um, that we use in forensics crime scene investigations. Okay, so let's check out this wildlife scene. When I show this to people, uh, many times I say, you know, like, okay, what do you guys see? And basically they're like, well, I see a dead thing, or I see bones. And I'm like, okay, well, look a little bit closer. Tell me something specific that you see. Well, they're going to point out that there is a lower jaw here, and that's, that's good. They're going to point out the obvious skull over here. They're going to point out some really big leg bones, possibly this broken pelvis bone, some cervic, cervical bones, which is you know, part of the spinal cord. These are the ribs. And I'll say, well, what else do you see besides the bones? Well, they start to see the acorn cap. Uh, they see the walnut hull and the acorn. They see the piece of fox tail, some bark. They all of a sudden realize that they're looking at the, the locust shell. Uh, they say, well, it looks like we see some extra teeth here. There's some, there's some canine teeth and some pine cones. Um, anything else? Occasionally, some people pick out the penny. And then usually at the end, someone will pick out, like, wait a minute, what's that shiny thing laying there? Well. That's a 22 shell, and that particular shell is a spent shell, and you can tell because it's got the little indentation on the rim and it's got no bullet or powder in there. That's good, that's kind of some good evidence. That's kind of what we're looking for here. Anything else? And then occasionally somebody will be like, well, I don't know what that is. Well, that is the 22 bullet that came from the 22 shell. It's made of lead, which is a soft metal, and it's mushroomed. And so those are the kinds of things that I want people to be looking for other than it's just a dead thing. And so those are the kinds of powers of observation, things that we want people to look for now. I've been to a lot of different wildlife scenes and some wildlife crime scenes, and I've never seen them happen on a white piece of paper. So imagine if you weren't able to see them on this white piece of paper, how much harder it would be to see if, if, they were, if it was in the woods or in the leaf litter or the grass. So the other thing that I will do is I will talk to them you know, about the animal. Like, so, so what animal is it? It's a very common one. It's found everywhere in Pennsylvania. And I'll get lots of guesses like possum, raccoon, rabbit. And then I'll be like, really? I'm like, let's take a look at this skull and see what we can determine by looking at the skull. Well, he's got incisor teeth up here. He's got canines. 
He's got pretty sharp molars, and then the back molars are slightly flattened. So if you know anything about dentition, you'll know that that's from an omnivore. So a, a carnivore would have pointed molars all the way to the back. A herbivore would not have canines. So this guy is an omnivore, and he is a red fox. So one of the ways to tell is to have both fox skulls and compare them. So this is the red fox, and this is the gray fox. And one of the ways we tell is by knowing a little bit about the skull formation, and an, an easy way to determine the difference is to know about their genus. So a red fox, the genus is Vulpes, and that's in the shape of a V. And a gray fox is Eurocyan, in the shape of a U. So once you learn that, you have an idea what the fox skull looks like. If you find one with this shape on the top and a V, that's a red, and this shape on the top is a gray. So even though this isn't a game of clue, you can determine things by looking at a wildlife crime scene, using your powers of observation, and not saying, hey, that's just a dead thing or some bones. These are some of the tips, tools, and techniques our state game wardens use to solve wildlife crimes using forensics. Make sure to keep checking our Wildlife on Wi-Fi pages for additional lessons and activities on forensics and a host of other cool topics. Thanks for listening.